Hey guys, in the last video I formally proved the well-known formula that dv dx is equal to minus w of x, right? And I did that, let me scroll up, I did that through use of some pretty heavy calculus. It involved um, a lot of um, really complicated terms like the mean value theorem and limits and whatnot. It was quite challenging. In, so I definitely recommend you hit up that video first before you continue with this one. But in this particular video, what I'm going to be doing is showing you how to use how to derive this particular formula dm dx is equal to v of x this is the formula i'm going to be deriving in this particular video and it's very involved once again okay so let's get started in order to do this what i'm going to do is i'm going to take the sum of moments the sum of moments around this point just here which i'll call point o so let's do the sum the sum of moments around point O is equal to zero. And we know because it's in static equilibrium that it must be equal to zero. So let's do that. What's the sum of moments around point O? Well, first things first, we know that there will be M of X, which is going to be clockwise. So let's do that. That's M of X is clockwise. And let's see, V, the shear force will produ be producing um, a moment as well. V of X plus delta X but it can't be a force, it needs to be times by the distance, which is times by delta x, right? And we also know there's another um, moment due to this distributed load. Now, what is the moment due to this distributed load? To get, to get a good understanding, let me just redraw our chunk just here of delta x, of length delta x, I should say. This is the distributed load on top of it. Bam, 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 sweet. And don't forget that this is epsilon, which we defined earlier in the previous video. Now, in order to get the moment due to this entire distributed load, what I need to do is I need to find the moment due to a small slice of this distributed load and integrate. So let's consider a small slice here, just like we did in the previous one. Let's consider a small slice just here. And the area of this slice is the force, which I explained in the previous video. This is df. And that's going to be equal to W of psi times by D psi, because that's the area of this rectangle. But the moment is going to be quite interesting. The moment, let me write it over here. Let me write the moment. DM, that's the moment due to the small slice, is actually going to be DF times by the distance towards the slice. So it's going to be actually this distance, which I'm going to be timesing it by, right? And what is that distance? It's just epsilon, right? It's just epsilon. So that is what our moment is equal to. Well, our small moment due to our slice. To find the total moment due to this entire distributed load, we integrate. So let's do that. So we're adding that to the integral of df, which is w of psi d psi times by psi. That's interesting. From limits from 0 to delta x. And we know, actually, let me scroll over a bit so you can see. There we are. In fact, let me paste this below. I feel like I'm losing you. There we go. Let me just paste that below so I have some more space. There we go. And that's going to be equal to all the moments going in the other direction. There is only one moment going in the other direction, and that's m of x plus delta x. Right? So basically, we've got the moment m of x going clockwise. We've got the moment due to this distributed force going clockwise. We've got the moment due to the shear force going clockwise. And the moment of x plus delta x going counterclockwise. Okay, that's all sorted. Let's actually simplify this a little bit more by rearranging into a more familiar format. Well, we know we can rearrange to get m of x plus delta x minus m of x. And what's that going to be equal to? What's that going to be equal to? Um, well, we've brought that over there, so that'll just be v of x plus delta x times by delta x plus our integral 0 to delta of x of psi, oh, I almost said psi, I mean epsilon, w of epsilon, d epsilon. Whew, that's a mouthful, isn't it? All right, and uh, is there anything else? Nope, I think that's it. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to divide both sides by delta x so that I can get the definition of the derivative on the left-hand side. So if I do that, then I'm left with, in fact, let me write it in the next step. That's going to be m of x plus delta x minus m of x divided by delta x is going to be equal to 
is going to be equal to, let's see, well, the delta x on this side disappears because I'm dividing by both sides. x plus delta x plus the integral from 0 to delta x of epsilon, sorry, yeah, epsilon w of epsilon d epsilon. Whew. And that's all divided by delta x. Cool. So that's once we've divided both sides by delta x. This is where it gets interesting. How do we evaluate this term? What is it? Well, in order to do this, we need to refer to the mean value theorem again. So, so we also know if we were to plot our distributed load versus our value of epsilon, it looks like this. It will look like this. This will be epsilon just here. This will be w of epsilon. And it will look something like this. It will look something like this. And that's fair enough. But it's useless in this particular proof to, to use this particular picture just here. Instead, it would be much smarter to plot whatever this function is versus epsilon. So let's do that. Let g of epsilon equal to whatever this function is, which is epsilon w of epsilon. And the point I'm doing that is so that I can graph it. And let's do that. Let's graph that. It'll look like this. It'll look like this. This will be epsilon. This will be g of epsilon. And what does it look like? Well, we absolutely have no idea what it looks like. But we do know one thing. We know that if we analyze g as epsilon approaches 0, so if we know g of 0, what's that going to be? Well, that's just going to be equal to 0 because we've got this epsilon value just here. right? So we do know one thing about it. We know that not only is it continuous, but it it has a point just here at the origin. right? And the rest could be really funky. We don't really know what it looks like. It could be looking like that, say. We have no idea. right? But we do know this much, and that's and that's enough. All right, now it's important to use the mean value theorem. So if we use the mean value theorem, we can say that there must be, there must exist a point C, a point C um, within within zero and delta x, such that such that g of C times by delta x is going to be equal to the area under the curve. So that's 0 delta x g of epsilon d epsilon. All right? And this is a pretty tough thing to get, but let me walk you through the intuition. It basically says there's got to be a point c, so let's, let's make a point c just here, such that if you were to find its corresponding y value, g of c, g of c, and make a rectangle from it, so basically make a rectangle from it and shade in the area, there's got to be a point such that the area in orange, which I've shaded here, has got to be equal to the area under the curve, which I've drawn in blue. And I hope that can meet your um, intuition here, but that's basically what the mean value theorem states. And the point of doing that is so that we can get g of c, which we know is going to be equal to the integral of g of epsilon d epsilon with limits from 0 to delta x, that should be delta x, all divided by delta x just here. And there's a beauty in figuring that out because what we can do is we can actually substitute that all the way back into our original equation. So let's do that. On the left-hand side, we'll have m of x plus delta x minus, minus m of x all divided by delta x is going to be equal to v of x plus delta x plus whatever this entire term is, which we just figured out was equal to g of c, right? So let me write that in. That's going to be equal to g of c. That's the beauty of this entire thing. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate what happens when delta x approaches 0. So we're going to take the limit, the limit as delta x approaches 0. Well, the left-hand side is quite simple. The left-hand side turns into the definition of the derivative, which is dm dx. Right? But the right-hand side, what will that turn into? Well, this, this term right here will just turn into v of x. As delta x approaches 0, this will just uh, um, determine that will turn into v of x. What about this g of c term? What does that turn into? Well, you might have already thought that g of c turns into 0, but let's actually formally prove it. Well, as, well, as um, delta x approaches 0, it's pretty much like saying, what if this red line just here approaches 0? Well, let's think about it. What happens is this red line approaches 0. So basically, it's 
and caving in towards the left. It's moving towards the left. And as delta x gets closer and closer to 0, c, which must be sandwiched between 0 and delta x, must get closer and closer to 0 as well. Meaning then that c must approach 0. In fact, let me write in orange. That means c must actually approach 0. That's not all we know. We also know that g of c must approach 0 as well. That's because this point right here is 0. That's the most amazing thing about it. So g of c approaches 0. So we're going to be adding that to 0, leaving us with our final solution, dm dx. So that's the rate of change of our bending moment with respect to our length of our bar is equal to v of x. That is your solution. I hope that makes sense, guys.